Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone, and uh, blazing the project control skills trail then. So, first of all introductions, so I'm Shane Forth, you've got the biography in the pack, and here, and I'm currently PMO Director for Costain, but with a keen industry in the skills shortage, because I learned when I first became a manager in 1992, that there was a critical shortage of project controllers. There's a lot of work been done in the last 20 odd years uh, and you're going to learn about that and a lot of work very recently but there's still a problem I think most people would agree and um, I beg your pardon I've come to and Catherine here from the HITB has uh, been working with me the last four years on uh, a lot of activity to help resolve the skills shortage. So basically um, you know projects are important aren't they? Projects are what make um, you know, keep the lights on, heat our homes, provide us with uh, clean water, drinkable water, get us from A to B, and um, projects are very complex, a lot of projects are very complex in achieving those aims, so control of those projects is absolutely vital. But you know, historically and currently I guess there is a, a lack of good technical project controllers. Um, We've talked in a number of presentations today about the, the software jockeys, the Primavera jockeys. I'm gonna, that's going to come up in the presentation. Um, something to do with rotten bananas, so you'll probably wonder what that's all about. And um, Project control is a profession I think has lacked some status. I think that's improved. I've seen that improve uh, throughout my career. I think there's more to do, but it certainly uh, has lacked uh, status, and I think the more if we don't resolve this skills crisis and do it better, there's always a worry that that lack of status is going to happen because project managers will get bitten and say, project control doesn't work for me, the people haven't got the right skills, computer jockeys, whatever. So we need to raise the standing of project control in order to get good faith in it. And that's doing the job right and developing good people to do the job. And it's about sustainability, isn't it? Because I mean, I'm 60. Metabolically, I'm 45, by the way. I found that out at work. Um, and actually, we need to keep bringing people into the industry or else there'll be no controllers to control the projects. So, uh, 10 years ago, um, companies, a number of companies joined together, actually it was around about 2000 actually, to start to resolve the skills crisis and uh, blaze a trail for project controls and training and recognition. And that's the story I'm going to tell, bring us up to where we are and what comes next, because we haven't really publicised it as well as we might because everybody involved in it is doing day jobs. So initially I'll talk about the challenge of the, the project control skills gap that for me, having been around since 76 in the industry, 1976, began to emerge in the um, early to mid 1990s. Um, I mentioned the rotten bananas, we'll talk about that, you're all waiting to see what that's about. And um, I've got an analysis of what causes the project control skills gap, uh, which I'll show you and I'll explain that. Uh, the government have now um, picked up on the issue um, of apprenticeships, for example. Um, we'll move into the actions that have continued from having seen the, the problem. Some government reports, sorry, I'll cover on project controls. Believe it or not, there have been reports for government in the last 20 years uh, that says there's a dearth of planners, for example, a lack of estimators and so on. And uh, we'll move on to industry project controls working group, which is a real collaborative exercise. Uh, anybody remember partnering alliancing contracts? Anybody did, been involved in partnering alliancing? So this was a true partnership, a true alliance, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the first project controls apprenticeship that was launched in 2007, and the benefits that delivered. And um, national qualifications in project control exist. So we'll talk about those, the training standards that exist nationally, and uh, Trailblazer Initiative. Anyone heard of the government's Trailblazer Initiative? So that's for 3 million apprentices by 2020. How do you do that? Simple really, just call everyone an apprentice. Apparently you can have an apprentice MD, but in order to have any form of apprenticeship, there has to be an employer-led group formed to, de to deliver a program, create a program and deliver it. And that's people taking time out of the work and we'll talk about that as well with respect to project controls. Driving forward, where do we go next? Uh, and 
we'll talk about continuing to raise the status of project controls and continuing to help develop people for the future. And I appeal to people in the room if they wish to, to join the activity that's taking place. Uh, just a brief introduction of Costain, who I joined two years ago. So um, Costain are uh, probably more well known for their work in infrastructure. Um, I work in oil and gas, part of Costain mainly. But uh, basically, uh, we, our strapline is that we meet UK needs, we meet national needs. So it's not a big international organisation, it's 5,000 people, and it's all about maintaining the energy supply, involvement in projects in, in oil and gas, where I am in nuclear. It's about the water supply I mentioned earlier, the highways, the rail industry, getting from A to B, all those things. And we've got about 30 key clients, and 90% uh, of those, it's repeat business. Uh, which is a good place to be, isn't it? And um, the way we focus on our national needs is uh, all described in the centre of the slide. And uh, I won't go into that in detail because uh, we'll carry on with the, the main thrust of the presentation. And um, ECITB, so the Engineering Construction Industry Training Board, is the organisation that Catherine works for. And by the way, I might call her Christine later because I'm always making that mistake. Um, frequently. <laughs> so Catherine works for the ECITB. Uh, they've been very involved on the journey that's taken place over the last few years, a strong part of helping develop things. And I've been involved with the ECITB for 25 years and they've always delivered. We pay a levy as engineers and constructors. All engineers and constructors in the oil, gas and process and similar industries, energy industries, pay a levy. That's the supply chain contractors to the ECITB um, in order to get um, return on that levy in terms of training, career-long training for both um, tradesmen and professional management uh, people. And what I've found with the ECITB is you only have to ask and you get. Uh, so you, if you know about the ECITB in your business, you get a return on your investment by making, you know, asking for things. So they do all of the stuff you see on the slide and, and I just think uh, I can't speak too highly of them. Um, back to the main core of the, the skills gap, um, becoming evident to me certainly in the early 1990s. So I became a planning manager at AMEC in 1992, having been a senior planner uh, and worked through that career path from 1976. And I suddenly had to recruit planning engineers and it was like the game was changing, more computerised, wasn't Primavera for Windows yet, it's a bit harder than that, but uh, software was coming in. The planners we had in AMEC at the time were mainly engineers because that's how planning engineers initially became planning engineers um, when critical path analysis became a, a methodology uh, through the 60s really in the UK and 70s. So they were engineers so you put a XT computer in front of them, we weren't even on 286s then and it was like what the hell is this, how do I work this and it was really difficult and the software was not that easy. Um, and the other thing was that it was a bit of a kicking and screaming thing as contractors at that time. It cost £10,000 to train a planner and put an XT computer in front of him. And so, what do we want to do that for? It's just to please the client, you know. So it was really difficult to get anything happening. Um, technology was a problem, that change in technology. Uh, and by the mid-1990s though, it became really, like I say, a bit kicking and screaming, but it's like, by that time, Contractors generally realise we have to do it, you know, you have to do it in order to win work. And then we go on from there and the, uh, it's now integral to um, delivering projects, of course. But, um, you know, there was a, at that time, early 90s, mid 90s, the shortage of project controls were becoming very evident to me. And this is a good example of how that came about. So going into AMEC in 92, 17 planning engineers, and that was the focus of project controls then. Cost estimating and uh, what have you came a bit later. Put an advert in the Telegraph in March 93, got 120 responses. Most of the, a lot of guys in offshore at the time, offshore industry, offshore oil industry. The part of AMEC I was in was onshore, mechanical construction. I interviewed 18 that looked okay um, from a short list. Six of them, when I interviewed them, were okay out of the 18 but trying to get them to join us on staff wasn't easy and I got three of them to join. So that's how it, that went. 
By 1995, a similar pattern really, if you look at this, I had a few less people applying for another national advert, and again I ended up with getting three people to join. Something happened between 1995 and 97. Same advert, 12 applicants. I actually knew half of them, and the half I knew weren't that good. The other half, the CVs weren't that good. So we didn't interview any. So, oh my, that was really serious, wasn't it? Um, so that is a real acceleration of a skill shortage in four years. And just to highlight that, these are the people I recruited, not necessarily through the advert, so there's a few more on here. These are the people I recruited in that period, in time skills, for staff, not contract agency, not limited company. And you can see how long they stayed. It wasn't that long, most of them. Um, I recruited 12 planning engineers, and by early 98, they'd all left for agency work because the rates were attractive. And in a competitive industry, we couldn't afford to satisfy the, the needs of those guys. So that was really serious. And I had a 50% turnover in uh, 1997. I lost half my planners to agency. So, but there's no training, no career path, no, 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 no esteem, no, no professional recognition, nothing. So, but the money was there if people didn't work staff, so off they went. Right, some government reports. So in 2001, uh, the Department of Trade and Industry produced a report. Uh, 21 companies involved from the oil, gas and process industries. Some of you will recognise some of the names. And um, certainly highlights, as you can see, the difficulty in filling vacancies for project controllers, planning engineers, cost engineers, etc. And recognising an urgency to develop some skills and plan for succession, which wasn't there. Uh, people were leaving the industry due to the previous economic downturns. We just didn't have enough suitably skilled people. Uh, it's a bit groundhog day, isn't it? Does that feel like today? Or does it feel like 20 odd years ago? What do you think? So, over in the States, uh, Supreme of is coming in. We're moving further into the 90s. There's a guy called Jim O'Brien. That's the guy on the cover of the Engineer News and Record. He was around when just after the days of DuPont, where critical path analysis started in the American textile industry, Polaris submarines, uh, nu nuclear submarines. And uh, this guy, Jim O'Brien, who's got a really good book called CPM in Construction, a really good book on scheduling, uh, and three other PMI people, they just bemoan the, um, the problem of scheduling. Um, Primer had come in, and the way they saw it was that the <laughs> The way you can build a schedule in the tools today, including you know Primavera and everything else, you can put constraints in as many as you like, you can leave logic missing, you know, missing logic links, all sorts of things. And they saw this and they saw basically a lot of very poorly constructed schedules um, that uh, were flawed. They, they looked okay, nice coloured bar charts on, uh, on Primavera, but really they weren't right. Um, so Russell Lewington, whoever he is, construction manager for a no, I never heard of in the UK construction company. Um, his comment there about young guys slapping together schedules that look right. Anybody seen that? Nobody? Nobody seen push schedules? Thank you. Um, I don't just say it's the young guys actually. I've seen some older guys uh, slap schedules together. But basically, I think we can relate to this car. We can empathise with some of this stuff. Rotten bananas. Here we go. I sometimes put this on the front slide. By the fruit of the market, by the fruit of Tesco, it looks really nice sometimes, doesn't it? It's not always okay, is it? Planning today, at this time, this report was 2003, by the way, I think. Uh, landscape is littered with too many rotten banana schedules, yeah? bit like lifting the car, but, but bonnet up and finding no engine, eh? So it's saying a lot of schedules aren't that good. Some of them are, but a lot of them aren't. So I think that's a really good analogy of the situation. That actually was written by a guy who was um, on the um, sort of arbitration litigation side in uh, the States at the time, because actually 
project schedules in the states are a very core part of if that's if you, just the same as here really if you end up in that place which we don't really want if we can help it project schedules need to be right this is some work I did with um, well not I didn't do it. a team of people in the British Chemical Engineering Contractors Association I'll mention later did um, about the skills shortage when it first met in 2000 this group of project control managers I'll explain later have been working for 16 years we came up with the issues around project control the low status of the function demand and supply competition for resources you know the various the peaks and troughs in the economy so how do we train people when we don't know if we've got enough work to keep going and all the things you see on there um, that really um, I pieced this together years later but it was the essence of what we discussed as a bunch of project control managers that were looking to start to get to grips with the skills problem from the oil and gas majors and process and energy majors so we've got the main elements in red and we've got the root causes you can see all of them there um, I don't need to go through them all I think today um, I'll start another 20 minutes on the presentation but so industry was waking up let's say around about 2000 and um, another government report uh, more recently in 2008 uh, which the ECHTIB played a part in with Cogent and other organisations uh, recognising that project planning and control professionals are in short supply with that shift to self-employed status well don't forget I've just mentioned it was very evident in the 1990s so it had been going on for some time hadn't it but we started to develop new programmes and I'll talk, we'll talk about that uh, shortly so apprenticeships and things were beginning to be developed and more recently uh, changing to compete the Gibson report is known as in 2009 which was written following some industrial action at uh, Conoco's refinery in Lincolnshire in Thedlethorpe I think or Immingham um, picked up on uh, again among a number of other issues uh, you know craft trades is there yeah partly but certainly lack of experienced planners and project managers so we're going through this process and it's continuing this problem so uh, back in 2002 Basica so that's the British Chemical Engineering Contractors Association that was a lobbying group to the Department of Trade and Industry that has a number of professional working groups for different functions HR, IT, engineering, design, commercial and from year 2000 project controls a couple of the guys are here today I think uh, Dave Ladd and uh, Mike Younger if Mike's here um, got together and uh, discussed the issues that led to the fishbone diagram the Ishikawa diagram you saw earlier um, and we started to do something about it we formed a national working group with the ECITB with the Association of Cost Engineers with an organisation called Provoc that's not around now um, and that was to develop a national apprenticeship for project controls the aim was to get it running in London there were some logistical issues so it didn't happen um, and I was able to take that idea to the North East where I was working with AMEC and we got together with a number of other companies Acker Solutions, Siemens, K, K Home Engineering, a local company and we established an apprenticeship uh, we interviewed 26 people we made sure they all got the same salary offers from different companies we pre-selected so nobody got two job offers and developed on the job material on a just-in-time basis to set the programme up to a framework which we'll touch on um, key part of the framework was that the first nine months involved craft skills a bridge version of craft skills welding and pipe fitting to realize that doing work on projects certainly on the construction and of course takes takes time costs money needs resources and um, we started promoting the program and these people have done really well as you'll see later uh, and we have had on that first project control apprenticeship and subsequent schemes not the trailblazer we're now developing but the, the current apprenticeship that's still running 300 apprentices 100 of which are currently enrolled in the scheme on the back of the specification for the because what the guys did when they learned the craft skills was they also did project control theory in an off-site training center mock projects it's a gymnasium or a community centre or something like that and the other went through all the process of estimating costing work breakdown structures and so on for something they could relate to rather than an oil or gas terminal or something like that 
We took that learning material though, which was all about project control and projects, and that actually went into an offshore uh, project control program for project engineers and what have you that started in uh, 2009, initially with some of the offshore contractors you see on there, uh, and it's nine modules, so non-project control is essentially we're doing that program. So that gets some more understanding of people working with project controllers. And that's continued to date with 500 people having been on the program from 64 companies. And we're now developing a specific program with a case study for the nuclear industry rather than for oil and gas. And at this point I'll hand over to Catherine. There you go. Thank you Shane. So um, fast forward really to 2012. Um, and what happened was, uh, I think the government changed in um, 2010, didn't it? And um, a couple of years later, they kind of reviewed all the existing vocational qualifications. Um, there was still a case where the vocational qualifications for project controls, the take-up was quite low. And so they basically threatened that they were going to withdraw them, that they would no longer exist. Um, basically what this did was it, it galvanised the seeker and the ACOSTE and all the people that Shane mentioned before back into action and we reformed the project controls working group and the rest of the presentation is really about the work that this uh, industry led project controls working group what we've been doing um, so back in 2012 um, we reformed there was a, a real desire to kind of let's reinvigorate what we're doing the project skills gap is still the sorry the skills gap is still there. So together, you can see there a picture of us um, back in 2012 all together, um, where I, we agreed a definition of project controls, what we felt it uh, encapsulated. We identified a career pathway that we felt kind of gave people the option to see how they could move through from a project controller to a lead project controller or estimator up to being the head of project controls. Um, we reviewed and updated the vocational qualifications, developed comprehensive training standards and started to raise the profile. And I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the bottom three things on, on that slide. So the vocational qualifications, these are the vocational qualifications that are still available, that are still there now and there are still people, there are people studying on them. So the working group, all the companies got together, we reviewed the qualifications that existed at the time, uh, we refreshed them, we looked at technical focus so we made sure that um, they included more things about using the right software for the right things, a little bit more about actually being able to to plan on paper because it was felt that the people weren't so good as that as they used to be um, and um, made sure they had earned value management and some of the things in the, that hadn't been in them. So we updated them as well. Um, the VQs is it's just another name, they are the what were then VQs in the past. So in order to achieve one, uh, you have to build a portfolio of evidence that prove that you can actually work competently as a project controller in the workplace. And then just at the bottom you can see um, there's a level 2 one, there are four level 3 ones in project control practice, estimating practice, cost engineering and planning, so that's the equivalent of um, A level. And there are some at level 5 as well, um, project controls, estimating, cost engineering and planning practice. The idea here was for people coming new into the industry, they could actually work as their career progressed they could prove their competence at level two and then level three and as they became maybe a, as they become a lead estimator or a lead planner they can then um, gain their level five vocational qualification so we're starting to build the kind of the, the the training pathway and the skills pathway and the recognition of those skills as well so linked to that um, we also developed uh, the project controls working group we spent a year developing training standards so these are kind of like um, they detail uh, the scope the, the skills and the knowledge that are needed um, so that trainers and companies you know they're there so you can use them to develop your own training um, any training courses that are reviewed um, the ECITB will just quality check them and they will audit people that are delivering the training to make sure that it meets what the companies have said they want to be delivered. Um, they're all linked as well to the vocational qualifications. Uh, so basically if you do the training, um, then, then you should know what knowledge and skills you've learned linked to the vocational qualifications so then you can use that to gain that kind of official certificate of yes, I'm competent in this. 
And the third thing that was on the slide earlier was about raising the profile. So I'm aware that we've still got a lot more to be done about the work that we've done through the Project Controls Working Group. And this is like a good step for us to say, actually, as a group of companies, we're working together. But um, quite a lot of the um, companies, um, people like Shane and other people, they actually provided case studies about why they've moved into Project Controls and what they're doing. And they're available on this on this um, careers kind of it is like a flash driven website so that people can go on and they can see how they could progress through a career in project controls and what kind of job roles that could have and what people currently do and what kind of experience they have and that's available for any company to use or anybody to use. Okay, so uh, moving on a pace, I think, because I've probably talked too much in the first session, uh, for those who know me. Um, Richard Review 2012 of apprenticeships in the UK um, proposed some reform because the general view, view of that, uh, the outcome was that uh, the view was that apprentice programmes in the UK largely weren't that good. Although I think the one we had on project controls and have on project controls is one of the better ones. Um, so this is what's led to the Trailblazer initiative that I talked about earlier. Uh, basically, and um, from 2017-18, all new apprenticeship starts have to be trailblazers. So, people have to form employee-led groups to develop these programmes in accordance with um, process defined by government. Um, and this is where it leads to the three million apprentices by 2020 as still the current target. And that book is, uh, I think, it's about a 64-page guidance book that we need to follow. Uh, in creating these programs. And the key thing was that government wanted the apprenticeships to be employee driven, which I think, as it's been clear, the one we have already is employee driven, but in general across the UK they weren't. And it needs to be simple. Some of the frameworks were quite complex. And it's got to be about quality. Um, and to that extent, the government introduced what's known as an endpoint assessment, which is the main difference between the Trailblazer apprenticeship we've just developed and the, the current project controls apprenticeship. Um, so, um, we, f we put a proposal forward to form an employee-led trailblazer group for project controls in June last year and um, I'm very proud to be um, uh, leading that group and um, we've got 50 employers on it. Initially my contacts were mainly oil, gas and nuclear but with joining Costain I've been able to uh, establish connections with wider sectors of UK industry so we've got a good spread. Uh, we, uh, we have to write what's known as a standard, you'll see that in a minute, what it means. And that was approved by the Minister on the 14th of June this year. We really had to fight hard to get the standard we wanted, with the qualifications in it we wanted. The endpoint assessment is virtually ready, we've just got some very minor comments to address, and we'll show you what that kind of looks like. And uh, it's basically ready to launch in 2017, this uh, level three project control trailblazer apprenticeship. There are about seven levels of apprenticeship. It's not just about school leavers, remember, or to people. So that's, uh, the slide here just gives you the, the employers, the range of employers that are contributing. And we've had six meetings since September last year with over 20 people at every meeting in Manchester and um, we also supported by the professional bodies such as the Association of Costaneders of the APM and others. We've got academia there, some of the key universities and training organisations which we have to have because we have to line up the training people that are going to help deliver the scheme and uh, we've got a few other groups involved so that's the size of the organisation we've got and we've got about 160 contacts outside of this group that we keep up to date with what's going on that have shown an interest. I'll hand you briefly back to uh, Catherine again for a moment. So I'm just going to talk you through what we've done to create the Trailblazer um, that, um, apprenticeship that's going to be launched next year and then we'll go on to kind of the plans, the, the future. Um, still to do. So this is just some photographs of our Trailblazer group. I think Shane just said, you know, we've got at least 20 people coming along to each of the 20 meetings, a whole variety of people. And it's been amazing. Such a, such a, it's been an honour really. I'm there, I support everyone. I just kind of write up the notes and get everyone together to make sure we move forwards. But it's an amazing bunch of people who are really dedicated to the project controls profession. Really trying to look into make sure that it's an exciting profession and that the 
that it becomes more recognised and that there's really good training for people as well. So, just to talk you through the process of developing the apprenticeship standard, this is, these are some um, government slides here. So you can see you bid to develop the standard, so you get support from a minimum of 10 employers. The government then reviews it and decides whether or not you can go ahead. Uh, you then develop your standards, I'll talk a little bit more about that, and you then, you then put that back in for approval. They put it up for consultation, then they provide, give it a funding um, cap, then that is approved and then you develop the endpoint assessment together and then they approve that and again that goes up onto a government website for consultation and that anybody can input to. So, One really important thing that um, all apprenticeships have to have 20% off the job training so they expect there to be quite a lot of off the job training uh, at the beginning of the apprenticeship as well as the training within the companies. So, developing the level three standards. So, I touched on it briefly earlier. We'd already reviewed the vocational qualifications and developed the training standards. So, we had a good idea up front about the knowledge and the skills and the behaviours that we wanted the apprenticeships to come out at the end of the apprenticeship with. And also, we had a good apprenticeship there already to build on, basically. So, we developed the level three standards. We put it up on um, what's it called, Survey Monkey. Uh, we mailed out all relevant people within the ECISB, all relevant contacts of anyone that was in the working group and all members of the Association of Cost Engineers, of which there are 1,600, to in invite comments. Um, we had about 68 responses uh, and the vast majority was very positive. And alongside that as well, um, we basically put all the elements in there. They're very short, the apprenticeship standards. I'll show it to you in a minute. It's only two sides, so you can actually consult on every single word that's in there. But, but the thing that was so good about the feedback we got, we got feedback across the board. So from so people that Shane's mentioned, like Costain and Amec and Dusan and Magnox, that, um, but also other people like... Um, Balfour BT and, and a whole range of people uh, input through the Survey Monkey. And one of the big things in there was we needed to build in about team working, communication. So, it, yes, all the skills elements uh, on planning and scheduling and, uh, and cost engineering estimation, that was all very good, but could we build in more about the communication, giving people the right information at the right time? So that's the standard. You can't read it from here, but that is the standard in its entirety. You can download it from the government website. Um, and then the thing that's different is the endpoint assessment. And this is what the endpoint assessment is in a nutshell. You have a knowledge test, a practical test, and a structured interview. And, sorry, just to go back one stage, you do the training, the apprentice does the training, uh, they achieve the vocational qualification, they may or may not also study for something like a BTEC uh, alongside that. And then the employer, you hold a gateway assessment to see if you believe that the um, apprentice is suitable for putting forward for the endpoint assessment, because clearly as an employer you want to make sure that they pass it. This endpoint assessment is, includes a knowledge test, a practical test, and a structured interview. And between them, they will make sure that your apprentice will be a competent project controls technician when they have achieved their official apprenticeship. And there are four, well, three grades, really, because fail doesn't really count as a grade, but you can fail it. So you can fail past American distinction. And one of the very interesting things is having, as part of the development of these apprenticeships, we've actually involved apprentices in it, and they felt quite strongly that people should be able to fail, as well as that the good people should be able to get a distinction. And so as we have those levels there. And you can see, you must have a merit in the practical, and you must have a merit in, in the practical to, uh, sorry, and you must have a distinction in the practical to gain a distinction, because the working group as a whole felt quite strongly that the, the practical skills were a very key part of um, being a good project controller. So, down to about five minutes, we need to get Yeah, not again. Thanks, I'm going to have to, have to race even faster now. Um, the five people you see on here are five of the first 14 apprentices back in 2007, not long after we took them on. They'd had nine months off the job training, they'd had less than a year in industry, they were 17 years old. And you can see the comments they were already receiving in the workplace for the work they were doing. So the benefits were coming through pretty quickly actually. At the end of the apprenticeship, when they'd completed it, these same folks in 2011-12, I surveyed the operations and project managers 
which are the key customers in a way for those folks. And these are some of the comments, I have more, that these, these uh, 20 or so option project managers said. I think they speak for themselves, um, you know, and uh, show that it was making a difference. So driving forward now, um, we, as we've explained, we've now built the level three uh, project con controls technician apprenticeship. Uh, I mentioned there are seven levels, so we're now embarking on the next step to build an advanced uh, project control, higher level project controls apprenticeship. Um, so that will be for people who've been practicing the art of project control for a while, actually. And um, we'll need to submit a proposal and go through the whole cycle again. But this time the group have been through it once, so we've got the advantage now of knowing exactly what it entails. And uh, so we'll be submitting that proposal the first quarter next year. Welcome anyone who wants to join the group and add to it to influence the outcome of that. Uh, linking with professional bodies, as I say, we did that right through the early days with Basica. We've had APM, sorry, ACOSTE and ECITB at the Project Control Managers quarterly meetings for probably about 14 years now in order to keep this thing, these things moving. So we continue to um, link with professional bodies and including the Engineering Council, and that's very important for the status of project controls. Um, We've got the, uh, the basic career path that you can see on the left of this slide, uh, the training in the middle that we've been talking about with the, the key element being the vocational qualifications and the key professional body for project controls, which is an important part of government requirement that there's a professional body, ACOSTE with its grades of membership on the right. And ACOSTE have built something called tiered accreditation. Tiered accreditation aligns with the Eng Tech. Uh, qualifications, INC and R -Eng, for those of you who know those qualifications for design engineers and um, it's a process by which people can get that recognition in their profession um, through acquiring some of the higher level five vocational units and they've mapped this qualification which is, there are different routes to it mapped it to chartered level and it's it's been matched against it, benchmarked against it, it's not chartership but if you come up with a tiered accreditation at the top end of it, certified professional, in estimating cost of planning, you have what ACOSTE regards as the equivalent of chartered project controller. But we can't call it that. So that's already got a number of people on the programme since 2012. And where are we going next? So the ACOSTE are now aiming for, uh, to follow in the footsteps, we hope, of the APM getting very close now, at last, with project management. Uh, despite all the obstacles, we're now hoping uh, and proceeding now along the lines of getting chartered project control status. Uh, we're working on it, we're moving along, and we hope to get there at some point in the future. So this is about the status, isn't it? So that actually, um, we've just about made it then after all that, uh, brings us towards a conclusion that we are maintaining momentum, we're not resting on our loyals. The hard bit is promoting what we're doing, because we're also busy in the day job. Um, but really, you know, all the steps are in place, there's a lot more in place than some people realise to develop project controllers to resolve that skills problem and um, for anyone who wants to work with Catherine and I, join the group, participate in initiatives, please contact us, we'd very much welcome it. Thank you. So I'll take any questions if we've got time. I, I know it's quite close to the bar. <laughs> oh, we can discuss afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. How, how do you get people excited about getting this question? Mark Child came home to me. So. Yeah, Pon Iting from Korean Brown. Well, I'll tell you exactly what happened then, because um, you're right, it's a fair old question, because a young person of say 16 probably doesn't know what project controls is, and we haven't necessarily got a definition. Basica have one, by the way. But yeah, what's project controls? So when we interviewed the first tranche of apprentices, the 14, we actually did a panel interview with the four employers. It could be a bit scary. But we decided to, um, I kind of, we all did a bit of something, and they said, well, you do it, Shane. <laughs> and I produced a pack which had, for instance, a leaning tower of Pisa on. Asked the guys if that's a successful project. Because it's leaning over, isn't it? it wasn't meant to. And it's interesting what answers you get. Because it's kind of turned out successful, but not for what it was built for. Gave them the traditional iron triangle. 
talks about what if you go on a holiday, what's important, cost time, quality, or this kind of thing. Showed them some simple pictures and bits of what we do um, in project controls, and some case studies of what projects are about. We created a video with the ECITB that lasted about 10 minutes. Uh, lots of things to try and enthuse them, but it is, you know, there's so many things today. Uh, engineering as a whole probably isn't as attractive as it was 20, 30 years ago. So you have to do something to encourage them, but you've got to get out there. Uh, I think it's worth saying that our last um, working group meeting, we, uh, in, we basically agreed to set up a subgroup on marketing uh, and we started to gather kind of quotes about what's so great about project controls uh, and the idea is to produce like a few very small kind of tools or videos or comments for, for companies to use so that by working together hopefully we can start to get more 16 to 18 year olds enthused by, by the th fact that a lot of companies themselves go out into to schools. So. Yeah, but it's a tough one so we yeah. welcome any ideas. Yeah. Okay, Any thank you. One up from Phil, I think. Yes, Phil. Uh, Phil Budden. Um, presumably this involves block release to have external yes, well, training. So what we've got, what we've got in the current programme is a BTEC. We, we use civil for the built environment initially with prescribed units because there was nothing else. We've now run it with that and sometimes with the engineering BTEC. Um, the BTEC isn't mandatory in the new apprenticeship because we couldn't quite get there with government and we also have to cater for small employees that's another rule of the <coughs> trailblazer but we fought and got the vocational so there is a BTEC for those companies who do BTECs it's absolutely the funding's there for yeah, it yeah. back from the levy yeah. the, the indicative is quite a high level yeah, of grant, a good level of grant funding which yeah. will cover we someone doing a, um, a BTEC of, yeah. of whatever sort is relevant yeah. well that's catered for yeah. Looks like time for a drink, does it? it does. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone.